Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. And so today, very apropos on this Easter Sunday, we're going to be talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And if it were not for the resurrection of Jesus, then none of this would be a reality. The church wouldn't be a reality. Uh, there would be, you might as well, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you might as well put a for sale sign outside this church and fire the staff and, and just move on with your lives. Because everything hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. This is the most important date in the Christian calendar, much more important than Christmas. If it were not for this day, then Christmas would be meaningless. So I want to talk to you about the reliability of the resurrection of Jesus, and I want to talk about some of the, the points here. I may need an extension cord uh, just to plug in my computer, just so we don't lose the PowerPoint. So if there's an extension cord, uh, that'd be great. Um, so I want to talk to you today about the, the reliability of the resurrection, and I want to talk about the various points that even the most critical scholars would accept about the resurrection of Jesus. And I use this argument in my debates, and I use this argument usually in university presentations to, to show that something happened 2,000 years ago that spawned the Christian movement. I want to begin by quoting from 1 Corinthians 15, and I want to quote here a passage in 1 Corinthians 15 where the Apostle Paul is talking about the resurrection. Resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, and embedded within this piece of scripture, we have the earliest Christian creed. It's so ancient that it dates within months of the Christian movement. It was being orally confessed in the church within months. That is extremely early. And the, the, the latest scholars would place this creed is five years, no more than five years. So the Apostle Paul writes 1 Corinthians about 20 years after the resurrection. It's written around 50 to 55 AD, and this is important. Because what it shows is that Paul is writing this two decades after the resurrection, which means that this is still within the living memory of the eyewitnesses. We still remember things that happened 20 years ago. I certainly remember what happened 20 years ago as if it was yesterday. So this is a very early letter, and Paul says to the Corinthians, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And here comes the creed. For I delivered as a first importance what I also received. So Paul is saying here that he's delivering to us something that he received. This is not Paul's material. He's transmitting information here. And where did he get this information from? Well, remember in Galatians 1 and 2, we're told about a visit that Paul took to Jerusalem, and in his first visit to Jerusalem, he met with Peter for two weeks. For 14 days, he said, he met with Peter. And we know that they were not talking about the weather for two weeks. They were talking about Jesus and what he taught and so forth. So Paul is citing here very ancient information, very early information. And here's the creed, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That there, folks, is the earliest creed in the Christian faith. And you will notice that the earliest creed is based on three important things. Christ died, Christ was buried, Christ was raised. Which means that from the earliest time, Christians were teaching and preaching the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. And Paul calls this the gospel. This is the very heart of the gospel. And then notice he says, and then he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, which is the Aramaic name of Peter, which also shows how early this is. Paul's using the Aramaic name of Peter, not his Greek name. And then he appeared to the 12. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep, that is, they've died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And then last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So notice Paul witnesses, he apprides a list of witnesses here. And here Paul is using evidentialist apologetics. Now, most Reformed folks are presuppositional. I'm presuppositional, but there's a place for evidence. And here Paul is citing evidence. He's saying, look, there are eyewitnesses who saw him. There is Cephas, or Peter, there's the 12, there's more than 500 people who saw him. That's enough witnesses to put you in jail for life. And he says that among these 500, most of them are still alive, although some have, have fallen asleep. And then he appears to James, this is the Lord's brother, we'll talk about him in a minute. And then Paul says to all the apostles, and then last of all, the last one to have 
a resurrection appearance that was made to him was the Apostle Paul. That's why after Paul, there is no more resurrection appearances of the Lord. And so when people tell you, like Benny Hinn and all these faith teachers tell you, that Jesus appeared to them in their bedroom and had a discussion with them in the morning, they're lying to you. Jesus does not appear. He would appear in visions, as we see in the book of Revelation, but the resurrection appearances, his bodily appearance in resurrection, ceased with the last of these witnesses, that is the Apostle Paul. Now, what is interesting is that there are five core historical facts that we know about Jesus. And even the most liberal scholar is willing to concede these five points. Why? Because the evidence is so overwhelming for this. And so we've got multiple attestation. We've got four gospel accounts. We've got the book of Acts, which is part two of Luke. We have the letters of Paul, which are believed to be very, very early. And among these five historical facts are the following. Jesus died by crucifixion on a Roman cross. He was buried by Joseph of Arimathea. The tomb of Jesus was discovered to be empty by a number of female disciples on the third day. And there were post-mortem appearances of Jesus to the disciples. And fifthly, this comprises the origin of the Christian way. So I want us to look at each one of these because these are very important. Again, scholarship believes that Jesus died on a Roman cross he was given an honorable burial. Some would dispute that, but he was given a burial. Number three, there's overwhelming evidence that on the third day after his death, the tomb of Jesus was discovered to be empty. And it was discovered to be empty not by male disciples, but by female disciples. And then fourthly, these disciples claim that they saw the risen Jesus after his death. And then if you take points one to four, they are a cumulative argument that leads to five. This is the origin of Christianity. So Christianity did not start with the birth of Jesus. It didn't start with the teachings of Jesus. It didn't start with the miracles of Jesus. Christianity started with the proclamation that he was alive again. This is unique to Christianity. You don't find that in any other religion. All the other religions of the world are based on the teachings of their teachers, their prophets, their sages. But there's one thing that they all have in common. They all died and they stayed there. Christianity is different in that its founder is alive. When we look at the first one, when we consider the death of Jesus, this is virtually accepted by everyone. The only people who deny it is those who say he never existed. Well, obviously, you can't have a crucifixion of someone who never existed. So when we look at the death of Jesus, we have to consider these points. Number one, this was the most public event of his life. Why is it the most public? Crucifixion was done in the highways, that is to say, in passageways, where there's a lot of human traffic. And it was done deliberately by the Romans to instill fear on those who would dare challenge Rome. The warning was simply that if you mess with Rome, this is what's going to happen to you. And it was done deliberately to instill fear. Secondly, it was the most humiliating aspect of his life because crucified victims were crucified naked. Now, all pictures of the crucifixion depict Jesus with a loincloth around his thighs. And even Mel Gibson in The Passion forgot that point too. Crucified victims were naked, and this was done to heap shame on them. Uh, they were naked at the flogging post, and they were naked at the point of crucifixion. And that's why we're told after his death, we're told that they took his garment, they took his tunic, and they cast lots for it. They stripped him of his clothing. And so this is a very humiliating public event. So Christ hangs naked for us, and he's not ashamed of us, but yet, how many of us are ashamed of him? And how many of us deny him Peter denied him three times. How many times have we denied him? And Judas betrayed him. How often do we betray him? Number two, this is accepted as a historical fact. Even atheist scholars will say, yes, Jesus of Nazareth died by crucifixion around the year 30 to 33 AD. Number three, Jesus was really dead. He didn't pass out on the cross. He was truly killed. He was clinically dead. This was guaranteed by the spear thrust to his heart. We're going to talk a little bit about that as well. He was killed, ultimately he died, but the spear thrust was to guarantee that he was dead. And the effusion of blood and water that John witnessed is a very interesting phenomena. Uh, John didn't know what that water was, but now today we know through medical science and cardiology that when someone is in a deep state of agony and pain, the, there's a membrane around your heart, the pericardial membrane, and what happens under intense pain and agony that pericardial uh, membrane begins to fill up with pericardial fluid, clear like 
water-like fluid, then your lungs, because the person is hung on the cross, they have to rise up to expand their ribcage to breathe, the lungs would eventually collect water as well. And so when Jesus dies and this Roman soldier pierces his side, we're not told which side he pierced, but when he pierced his side, notice John says, I saw blood and water come out. Now the blood, of course, was collected in the chambers of the heart, the collection of blood there in the chambers, and that water-like fluid was the fluid enveloping the heart called the pericardial fluid. And it could also have been water inside the lungs because of asphyxiation. And so what John saw is confirmed today by medical science, and it's the sign of a ruptured heart. In other words, Jesus died of cardiac arrest. He, he literally died of a broken heart. His heart ruptured. And so that pericardial effusion, the blood and so forth, are all signs of a, of a massive cardiac arrest. Number four, the death of Jesus was considered a scandal to Judaism, and it was also, the crucifixion was the death of an accursed criminal. Now, why did Judaism consider it a scandal? Well, because Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, whoever hangs on a tree is cursed by God. And they applied that to crucifixion. That's why Jesus' death is also said to be that he was nailed to a tree. He bore our sins on the tree. And so to the Jews, it's a stumbling block, as Paul says. How could the Messiah, the king of Israel, how could he die the death of an accursed criminal? That's why Christianity was so hard to swallow by the, the Jewish people. Because here you've got a bunch of Jews saying the Messiah is the son of God, the king of Israel, and yet he dies the death of an accursed criminal, according to the Torah. And so that shows they was not made up. Why would they make something up like that? That's the hardest thing to convince your fellow Jews about. But Deuteronomy 21, 23 says that the accursed criminal is to be hung on a tree. But Paul says in Galatians 3, 13 that Christ became a curse for us. The reason why he was hung on a tree and he received the curse was for us. Not because he had sinned, but he bore the penalty. He bore the curse on our behalf. And so we know the death of Christ was a guarantee. Number two, we have the burial of Jesus. Now, to the Jews, burial was a sacred duty. To leave a body hanging on a tree, Deuteronomy 21, 23 says you must not leave the body uh, on the tree till evening. It must be taken down before evening. And that's exactly what happened with Jesus. He was taken down on Friday before Friday evening because Friday evening is the beginning of the Sabbath. And so they, brought, they put, put his, took his body down and, and they gave him a burial. So the body had to be buried within 24 hours. And that's still practiced today in Judaism and in Islam. So when someone dies, the body must be buried as soon as possible within 24 hours. So Jesus being a Jew, and of course his followers respecting him, the Romans would sometimes leave the bodies on the cross and let dogs of prey and, and crows and various birds of prey come and eat the body. And so you would see half-eaten bodies on the cross. It was a very horrid spectacle. And so this would have been a great dishonor, of course, for Jesus. But because it was Passover, the, the, the procurator Pontius Pilate was warned by the emperor Tiberius not to mess with the Jews because Tiberius had put Pilate under probation. That's why Pilate is very nervous at the trial of Jesus. It's not because he's Jesus' buddy. It's because he's under trial, probation, and we know later that Pilate was eventually um, exiled and he committed suicide according to the, the, the documents we have. So we need to understand that the Sanhedrin who put Jesus to death, there were two disciples there that were disciples of Jesus, Joseph, Arimathea, and Nicodemus, and they had certain clout with Pilate, and so we're told that Joseph went and pleaded from Pilate for the body of Jesus. So the burial of Jesus is important. It ensures that he was clinically dead. You obviously don't bury live people. Number two, the burial of Jesus was conducted and supervised by a member of the Sanhedrin named Joseph of Arimathea. And this is a very embarrassing feature because Joseph of Arimathea was part of the very Sanhedrin that condemned Jesus to death. Why would you have a member of the Sanhedrin do right by Jesus? You would expect Peter or John or James to do this honorable thing, but no, they're too busy hiding because they're afraid of the authorities. But Joseph of Arimathea takes it upon himself, being a member of the council, he's also a secret disciple of Jesus, to give Jesus an honorable burial. In John's account, you have both Joseph, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, and they're giving Jesus a royal burial. If you look at the amount of spices and myrrh they used for the burial of Jesus, that is the burial of a king. That's not the burial of a commoner. 
And so here you see the king. This is the burial, the royal burial of the king. And thirdly, it is a historical fact. Now some scholars who want to deny the resurrection, they know where this is going because what they do, like Bart Ehrman, for example, says Jesus wasn't buried in a, in, a, in a family tomb. Jesus would have been thrown into a common grave with other criminals. So they would open up this big grave and they would throw all these bodies of crucified victims in there, and then the disciples later made up the resurrection. Not so fast, Bart, because we need to understand that, you see, by getting rid of the burial account of Jesus, according to the Gospels, what he does is he calls into question the empty tomb. Because if Jesus is thrown into a common grave, then he's not in a tomb that everyone knows where he's lying, and therefore the tomb story has been eventually made up. Not good enough. That doesn't add up. We know that people who were, uh, had, had connections to the Sanhedrin, we know that these people sometimes were an exception to the rule. They were given honorable burials, as, as we see in Josephus. So what this shows us is this. The burial of Jesus was witnessed by female disciples, and it was Joseph's own tomb. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the burial place of Jesus was known. The location of his tomb was known to both Jew and Christian alike. Therefore, if you know where the tomb is, then you can go and check it. This is important. Because what we know from history is that the tombs of rabbis and holy men were usually marked and noted by their followers. We also know that, the, that Caesar placed a seal on that tomb, that no one was to... to to go and disturb the tomb. So now we know Jesus died. He's given this honorable burial. And we know where he's buried. It's Joseph's own family tomb. And besides, the women escorted him to his funeral. Now this is very interesting because it's the women who are there at his death. Of course, John is there for a period and then he disappears. And the women escort Jesus to his funeral, not his, not his male disciples, and isn't it interesting that poll after poll after poll has shown that women are far more faithful in church attendance than men? Because men are too busy watching the Super Bowl at home on Sunday, or they're too busy watching hockey or basketball, and it's the wives that are going to church and sometimes taking the children. It's the women who were there for him at the end. It was the women who escorted him to the tomb. And it was a woman who first saw him at his resurrection. It was not a male disciple. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, a woman. He entered the world through a woman, not a human father. His humanity came from his mother. Therefore, God enters the world through a woman, and he appears first after the resurrection to a woman. Does that sound like a male chauvinist book to you? Not at all. Not at all. And so, we know where he's buried. We know the location. Pilate even put guards there to secure it. But we know where it is. Thirdly, something happens. The third day after his death, notice again, it's the women who come to the tomb, not the men. They're hiding out of fear of the authorities. The women come to the tomb to finish off the honorable uh, putting of, of myrrh, and even though that was done by Joseph and Nicodemus, the women wanted to honor him by also putting spices on the body. Why did they put spices and, and myrrh on the body? That was to retard the decomposition of the body. It's to retard decomposition, to hold it down. Right? And isn't it interesting, when the Magi came looking for the king of the Jews who was born, what did they bring? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. He was laid in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes, and now he lies in the tomb, wrapped in a shroud. All the Gospels and the book of Acts agree the tomb was empty. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, four independent witnesses, multiple attestation, one of the necessities in the historical critical method to establish facts. Four independent witnesses. Paul is another witness. We're going to talk about him as well. And... The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 agrees the tomb is empty. How do we know that? Because he says he was died, and he was buried, and he rose again. Paul never mentions the third day in his letters. Where did Paul get the idea that he was raised on the third day? Paul never talks about the third day resurrection. That shows us that's not Paul's language. He's getting that from the Jerusalem apostles. 
And so Paul was a Pharisee. And one of the things the Pharisees believed was resurrection. The body goes in and the body rises into immortality. The same body that is laid is changed in resurrection. Paul was not a Sadducee, right? Remember the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection? That's why they were sad, you see? Paul was a Pharisee. He believed in the resurrection. And the empty tomb, however, was not enough to build faith in the resurrection. Why? Well, if a loved one passes away and, and they're taken to the morgue and, and someone says, oh, by the way, something strange happened this morning. Um, your Uncle Tom, his body's not in the morgue. We can't find his body. No one says, hallelujah, Uncle Tom is the Messiah. What they do is they call the police and say, we've had a body snatcher. There's been a theft of the body. And in fact, Mary Magdalene, after she saw the Lord, she is the first to announce the resurrection. Isn't that lovely, ladies? The first person to announce the resurrection was a woman. It was her. She went to the apostles and she said, the Lord is risen and we have seen him. Now, the apostles understood that you never believe women early in the morning, before coffee, especially when they come from cemeteries. <laughs> and so Mary Magdalene said, I saw the Lord. And they're saying, well, Mary, it's been a really long weekend and, you know, we're tired and maybe, maybe you just saw things. They didn't believe her. And Jesus chides them later for not believing her. She's called by the church fathers, the apostle to the apostles. She was the first to declare the resurrection. And so, that's why they didn't believe. When, she, when they said the tomb is empty, did, did the apostles immediately think, wow, the Lord is risen? They thought something happened. Even Mary Magdalene, what did she say? Someone removed the body. Who took the body? And she meets the Lord in the garden, and she goes, please tell me where you placed his body. She doesn't immediately conclude that he's raised from the dead. You see, these people were not stupid. They weren't these, you know, we have, this, we have this chronological snobbery in modern day academia that thinks that all the ancients were dummies and they were hicks and they were village idiots and they didn't really know anything. Really? Really? You mean the Babylonians who created a sewage system in 500 BC were dummies? The Romans who created aqueducts that are still functioning today? The Romans that built roads that were amazing engineers? You think they were dummies? No, they were very, very intelligent people. And so you need to understand something that the missing body doesn't prove resurrection. It just simply means that something happened. Notice the apostles are looking for natural explanations. Someone must have removed the body. They must have taken it somewhere. Dead people don't rise up and walk out. You can ask your local funeral director, how many resurrections have you had this year? They'll say, none. How about last year? None. The year before? None. The death rate is still one per person. People just don't get out of their caskets and walk out. So they're not going to believe Jesus simply rose because they heard the tomb was empty. That's not enough. Notice Paul says that Christ was buried and then he was raised. This implies Paul believed in the empty tomb. He was a Pharisee. He, it's noted in the creed as well. But now we've got a third thing to contend with. We have the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, the empty tomb, and now we've got these post-mortem appearances. Appearances after death. Historians and scholars agree that the disciples of Jesus witnessed appearances of Jesus alive. Some of them will say, well, no, it wasn't Jesus, but they definitely saw something. There's something that changed them. They saw something. There's multiple attestation. Matthew mentions it, Mark mentions it, Luke mentions it, John mentions it. Even Mark's shorter reading. I don't think the long ending of Mark is, is part of scripture, but in the shorter reading, the appearances of Jesus are anticipated. He goes before you in Galilee. He will appear to you there. Paul saw him. 500 witnesses saw him. Think about 500 witnesses saw him. He appeared to, di to, to different people. He didn't appear to the same people all the time. He appeared to groups of people, sometimes the 11, the 500. He appeared to the two on the way to Emmaus. He appeared in different locations, sometimes in Galilee, sometimes in Judea. He appeared. And the postmortem appearances, however, were not enough for resurrection belief because if people said, I saw the Lord, like Mary Magdalene said, they said, oh, maybe you're hallucinating. Maybe you're dreaming. 
That's why, folks, you need to understand that the origin of the Christian way started because you have an empty tomb, you have the post-mortem appearances of Jesus. When you take those two together, this is what created the belief in the resurrection. Why? Because you see, if someone rose from the dead and you say, well, that person's hallucinating, you could still go to the tomb and the body's there. You could still, the body's lying there. You know, when you look at these crime investigations, when a body goes missing and there's foul play at, at hand and they start thinking, okay, something's happened, but we can't convict the suspect unless we find the body. Why do you think the Pharisees couldn't disprove the resurrection because they couldn't find a body? And so they started making up theories. We're going to look at some of those theories. They're pretty, pretty weird. So you've got an empty tomb, you've got an appearance, and he's not only saying this is the opposite of MC Hammer, you can't touch this. You can touch this. Jesus says, touch me, handle me, touch me. I'm not a ghost. Ghosts don't have flesh and bone. Touch me. I'm corporeal. Do you have anything to eat? We've got some bread. Ghosts don't eat. You ever saw the movie Casper? When the ghosts are eating, all the food is dropping on the ground. It goes right through them. Jesus takes bread, he takes broiled fish, and he eats it in their presence. Ghosts don't do that. Thomas, Venequa, come here. A week before, I will not believe, doubting Thomas. He's right here, sitting right in front of me. Doubting Thomas, the empiricist philosopher. Unless I can prove it with the five senses, unless I see, unless I touch, I will not believe. Because seeing is believing. He said that a week before. He wasn't there. A week later, the following Sunday, the Lord appears and he does a beeline to Thomas. He says, Thomas, come here. Take your finger and thrust it into my side. Thrust it into the holes in my hands. And Thomas is thinking, how did he know I said that? How did he know I said that? He must be God himself in flesh. And what does Thomas do? He brings the Gospel of John to its climax and he says, Ho kurios mu kai ho theos mu, my Lord and my God. The climax of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. And Thomas, the doubter, finally recognizes him for who he is. He is God himself incarnate. I've had cults say, oh, no, 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 Thomas wasn't calling Jesus God. He was saying, oh, my Lord, oh, my God. I said, really? So Thomas blasphemed God's name, and Jesus commended him. As a rabbi, he would have rebuked him. What does Jesus say? Because you see me, Thomas, you believe? Blessed are those who do not see me and yet believe. You know what that says? We're more blessed than Thomas because Thomas could see him. You and I see him with the eye of faith. And Peter says, without seeing him, we yet rejoice with joy unspeakable. And so, this is the resurrection. And Peter, on the book, in the day of Pentecost, in the book of Acts 2.32, Guess what the apostles said happened? God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses to that fact. We are the witnesses. We saw him. And you know what explains the resurrection? It wasn't the wrong tomb. It wasn't the swoon theory. They didn't, it wasn't a hallucination. God raised him from the dead. And the resurrection of Jesus is proof of God's, of God's existence. Why? Because dead people don't rise from the dead. It's a biological impossibility. Inorganic matter does not become organic. The brain, once it's dead, it's over. You resuscitate someone with brain damage, they're probably going to be a paraplegic for the rest of their life. Jesus was really dead. And he was raised from the dead, which means something outside of our space-time continuum reached in and raised him. Because nature doesn't raise people from the dead. It's a powerful witness to God's existence. 
And so the apostles said it was God who did this. We need to consider, folks, the radical change in the disciples. We need to consider this. This is very important. Most of the disciples of Jesus died as martyrs for their faith in Christ. People don't die for something they know is a lie. Nobody does that. Your life is too precious. People die for a just cause. They'll die for their country. They'll die for their families. They'll die for a friend. Sometimes Jesus says if that no greater love does a man have than to lay down his life for a friend. And so the disciples went to their death with the confession, Jesus is Lord, and he's raised from the dead. Peter died upside down. Paul was beheaded in Rome. Bartholomew was skinned alive. Thomas was speared to death by the Hindu Brahmins in India. Andrew and Philip were crucified on X-shaped cross. You may have heard of St. Andrew's cross. It's the X-shape, right? If you look at the Union Jack, you've got the cross of St. George and you've got the cross of St. Andrew. That's the United Kingdom of Scotland and England, Britain. And so Andrew dies. The only one who didn't die, according to what the fathers tell us, is John. Not for lack of trying. They tried to kill the guy. He just wouldn't die. They put him in a boiling a cauldron of oil, wouldn't kill him. They couldn't kill him. They tried to poison him. He drank the poison. He survived. So they had no other recourse but to exile him. You got to put him in an island somewhere where he can't affect anybody. They throw him out into Patmos. And then the Lord gives them the book of Revelation. They couldn't kill him. So you exile him. That's why you have this idea of John not dying. Jesus implied that when he said, you know, what if I desire for him to live until I return? He didn't say he's going to remain until Jesus comes back, but the rumor was going around that he wouldn't see death. The Mormons, by the way, believe John is still alive today. He's just hiding out there somewhere. Probably in the local metro, buying something, like Elvis. You don't die for something you know to be a lie. Why would these disciples die for a lie? They died because they truly, you can, give, you can say you don't believe in the resurrection, but you must concede the fact they died believing it. The change in the disciple from a, a defeatist, hopeless estate to a bold and changed personality. Compare Peter before Pentecost and after Pentecost. Peter's afraid, he's hiding, he's fearful, and then he comes out and preaches the gospel. And we're told that at the end of his life, he was taken prisoner to Rome with his wife. That's right. The Pope had a wife. Roman Catholics are really shocked by that. What? Yes, Peter had a wife. And he's, put, he's condemned to death. He's, he's not a Roman citizen, and so he's given crucifixion. And as they're taking him to the place of crucifixion with his wife, his last words to his wife is, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. And then he asks his executioners, he says, please crucify me upside down. I am not worthy to die as my Savior did. And there, Peter died to the glory of God as his wife is also crucified. Paul, because he was a Roman citizen, he was given the grace of being beheaded, quick death. And Paul dies in Rome on the Ostian pathway to the glory of God. And he was greeted with a band of people and martyrs whom he killed as they rejoiced as Paul entered the portals of heaven. Welcome home, brother Paul. The ones he killed and had authorized the killing of under Rabbi Gamaliel and orders of the high priest. The Christian movement experienced exponential growth. In 20 years' time, Christianity was in Rome. Remember, there's no subways, there's no aircraft, they walked their way to Rome. Remember, the Romans built all these roads. 20 years' time, you've got Christians in Rome. How do we know that? Acts 18, the Emperor Claudius expels all the Jews and the Christians from Rome because they're fighting about this guy called Christus. Christ. How did they get there so quickly? With love and the passion of the gospel. They didn't go there with the sword and saying, Allahu Akbar. They went there with the banner of Christ with the love of Christ. As St. Augustine said, Christ preached his love. The cross was his pulpit from which he preached his love to the world. And that's what changed them. The conversion of James, the Lord's brother. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. He appeared to James. 
That alone, Professor Konzelman, a great New Testament scholar, said is enough, is enough evidence for the resurrection. Why? Because the brothers of Jesus didn't believe in him. None of them believed in him during his lifetime. That's why Jesus gave his, his mother to the care of John. Because he entrusted her to the care of believers. So James comes to believe that his brother is the Messiah and the risen Lord, and the only reason is the resurrection. Think about it. If you grew up in a home and, and you were told that your big brother is the Messiah, you would believe that, right? No, you wouldn't. How do you deal with a perfect sibling? He never lies. He's always perfect. It's always Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. He can do no wrong. It's like the Brady Bunch. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. How do you contend with a perfect sibling? They hated him. They wanted to entrap him. Go to Jerusalem, make yourself known to the world. And then all of a sudden, James, the first son of Joseph and Mary after Jesus, Jesus is virgin born, Mary and Joseph were married, and yes, Roman Catholic friends, married people can have children. And so James becomes the leader of the Jerusalem church. He leads the Jerusalem church in the book of Acts. He holds the first council, and it's not Peter who runs the council, it's James. He's the leader of the Jerusalem church. And we know about James because Josephus tells us about him. He tells us he's the brother of the one called Christ. And Janius, the high priest, condemned him for blasphemy and they killed him. And you know what the early church called James? They had a nickname for him. They called him Old Camel Knees. You know why they called him Old Camel Knees? Because he would pray for hours on his knees to the point that his kneecaps became gnarled with calluses. And Josephus tells us that they condemned him. He was so, even the other Jews gave him a nickname, James the Just, because he was so faithful. They condemned him for believing that Jesus was the Messiah. They took him to the pinnacle of the temple, we're told, and they threw him down from there, and then they took clubs and clubbed his brains out. That was the death of James, the Lord's brother. Why would he die for this faith? Because he saw the Lord. He saw the Lord, and he came to believe. Saul of Tarsus, Paul. How could Paul go from persecuting the early Christians to joining them and dying for his faith in Christ? How does he go from hating this movement, wanting them dead, to all of a sudden joining them? Something happened. And he tells us, 1 Corinthians 9.1, I saw the Lord. Am I not an apostle? I saw the Lord. He appeared to me, last of all. I used to be a persecutor of the church. He says, I was a blasphemer. He didn't blaspheme God. Who was he blaspheming? He was blaspheming Jesus. This carpenter from Nazareth, this cursed criminal, how dare you call him the son of God? What blasphemy. And the Talmud today perpetuates this hatred for the Lord Jesus by calling him a bastard, the bastard son of Pantera, a Roman soldier who had a sexual affair with Mary who was unfaithful to her carpenter husband. That's in the Talmud. And in the Talmud, Jesus is said to be suffering in Gehenna, suffering in boiling excrement and semen. That's right. So our dispensational friends, let's support, let's support, let's support the Jews. Let's bring them to Israel so we can hasten the rapture. I believe in the state of Israel. I believe in supporting democracy in the Middle East. It's the only democratic country. But remember, folks, our Jewish brothers and sisters there are being persecuted by their own people as they were 2,000 years ago and throughout history. They suffer to this day. We should be so supporting our Jewish brothers and sisters there. And so... When Christians walk through the streets, some of the ultra-Orthodox Hasidic Jews will actually spit on them. You can see it. Just check it out on YouTube. They'll spit on them, on Christians. And I would receive that as a badge of honor. The unexpectancy of Jesus' resurrection by the disciples. The Jews believed in the resurrection of the last day at the end time. There is no resurrection to immortality within history. 
No Jew believed, he, the, no Jew was looking for a dying and rising Messiah. All the literature tells us they were looking for a triumphant, kingly Messiah who would come, destroy the Romans, and establish the kingdom. They were not looking for a Messiah who would die. Even though the prophets spoke about it, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, they were so focused on their oppression that all they thought about was Messiah will come and he will destroy the Romans and liberate us. They were not looking for a rising, a dying and rising Messiah. How do we know the resurrection is on the last day? Because when Jesus went to resurrect or raise Lazarus to natural life, that's why he died again, not resurrection to immortality. Remember, he met the sisters of Lazarus, and Martha said, if you were here, Lord, my brother would not have died. And he said, he will rise again. And then she said, I know, on the last day. And Jesus said, and here's the Tony Costa paraphrase, Jesus said, you're looking at the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he said this, do you believe this? Do you believe this? The disciples did not understand when Jesus said, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise on the third day. Mark says they were talking amongst themselves. What does he mean by this? Even Peter says, no, 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 not so, Lord. You're not going to die. Because you see, Peter had foot-to-mouth disease. Peter thought he was the advisor to the Almighty. He had all the ideas, all the right opinions. You ever notice that? He was impetuous. You know people like that? Good talkers, but when it comes to doing, they're nowhere to be found. I have people tell, Dr. Costa, you should do this, and we should evangelize, and we should do this. I said, right, I'll see you on Friday night, and we're going to go witness. Where are they? They're at home. Good talkers. There's a lot of good talk talkers in the church. A.W. Tozer said Christians are the best liars in the world, especially when they sing. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Jehovah's Witnesses are at the door. Let's turn the lights out, turn the TV off, and let's pretend there's nobody home. Let's muzzle the dog. Onward, Christian soldiers. Let's go witness to the Muslims. No, they're terrorists. I'm afraid of them. That's what A.W. Tozer meant. We sing, but we don't do what we sing. Do we stand up for Jesus? Is it onward, Christian soldiers? Oh, we're too busy talking about retreats. I hate that word. We're going on a church retreat. Since when does the army of God retreat? Jesus said she will advance, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against her. We don't retreat, folks. We're on the move. We're moving forward. God put our faces in the front of our bodies, not on the back of our bodies, to move forward, to look forward. Sorry, I'm passionate about this. Because my wife and I were in Mississauga yesterday and we saw Muslims all over the place. Even the grocery stores are turning into halal grocery stores. What are the churches doing to reach out our Muslim friends? What are we doing? We're letting them go to hell. We don't care. I don't know what they believe. Well, let's learn. Let's have workshops. Ah, I'm too busy. I knew a, a huge Presbyterian church in, in, in Toronto that, that had a huge mosque be, behind them. And every Ramadan, that place was packed with Muslims. But they're too busy criticizing Roman Catholicism and reaching out to Roman Catholics, which you should be doing, but you've got a huge mosque with thousands of souls who are hellbound. What have you done for them? Oh, we're just focused on Roman Catholicism. Oh, I, I didn't know the Great Commission was just about Roman Catholicism. We weep for the lost. Do we weep for them? Do we cry for them? The Jews of Jesus' day did not believe in the dying and rising Messiah. The resurrection of Jesus was not an invention of Judaism because they weren't looking for it, and it wasn't a Christian invention because Christianity did not start until you have Pentecost. Now, just responding to the critics, you're going to hear some of the most bizarre theories as to what happened to Jesus. Number one, the swoon theory. Jesus didn't really die. He just looked dead. Do you really think the Romans were that stupid? you think Romans didn't know what death looked like? Why do you think they pierced his side to ensure he was dead? And how does a man come down from the cross, ripped to shreds with nails in his hands and his feet, on his side, he awakens in the tomb and then walks over to the mouth of the grave, rolls a stone with pierced hands that takes four men to roll, able-bodied, and then sneaks by the guards 
and then runs to the disciples and says, hi guys. And they say, hallelujah, my Lord and my God. They would be saying, get this man to a hospital. That does not inspire faith and jubilation. Swoon theory doesn't explain the resurrection. Number two, the substitution theory. It wasn't really Jesus, it was somebody else. That's the Muslim argument. That it wasn't Jesus who died on the cross. It was Judas Iscariot, or it was Simon of Cyrene. They, they confused him with Jesus, and, and, and they crucified him instead. No. They knew it was Jesus. I think his mother would know. You know, how many moms here, you know your sons more than anyone else? Yeah. I think Mary knew what her son looked like. I think John knew what his master looked like on the cross. Substitution theory is another natural explanation to explain away the empty tomb. Number one doesn't work, number two doesn't work. Number three, the conspiracy theory. This is the first theory ever created. The Pharisees said to the Roman guards, they could have been Jewish guards, by the way, because Roman guards would be killed for sleeping on duty, so they were most likely Jewish temple police. And so the Pharisees paid them and bribed them and say, just say that his disciples in the night, while you were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body. Notice they don't deny the empty tomb. They're trying to explain it away as a body theft. Now think about this for a minute. Let's, let's say you go to court and you take your, your neighbor Joe to court and say, Joe stole my, uh, he, he stole my uh, flat screen TV. Well, how, how do you know it was Joe? Well, um, the back door was broken and, and while I was asleep, um, Joe came in and, and he took my flat screen. To which the judge says, how do you know Joe did that if you were sleeping? If you were sleeping, how do you know that? You're not conscious, you're not awake. So you're going to tell me that, that while they were sleeping, the disciples snuck out in the night, went into the tomb, took the body of Jesus, put it somewhere, and then said, he's risen from the dead, and then said, I'll gladly die for that lie. Really? I don't think people die for lies. Conspiracy theories out the window. Number four, wrong tomb theory. The women went to the wrong tomb. Now, we're not talking about the Mount Pleasant Cemetery here. This is a small garden. We know where he was buried because Joseph of Arimathea owned that tomb. How could they have gone to the wrong tomb if it was Joseph's tomb? And they knew where he was buried. They were there. That's why the location of the tomb is so important. Number five, hallucination theory. They saw Jesus, but they hallucinated. Now, I'll grant you, individuals can hallucinate when somebody dies. I've, I've seen cases of that. But 500 people hallucinating the same thing at the same time? You mean, you mean group hallucinations are real? No, they're not. They're individual and they're subjective. How do 500 people or 12 people see the same hallucination at the same time? Impossible. Psychologically impossible. So that's why Jesus appears to groups. He doesn't just appear to individuals. He appears to groups. You can't have hallucination with groups, but with individuals. Now, you can have hallucinations if there's a hypnotist, and, and I've seen hypnotists take a whole crowd of people and say they're all chickens, and they're all going, quack, 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 quack. they're walking around like chickens. But you need the hypnotist to be real in order to do that. Jesus was seen. He was tangible. My favorite, the twin theory. Remember that movie, Dave? Someone was taking the president's place and he was a, like an identical twin. The twin theory. Jesus had a twin brother. Really? That should have changed all our Christmas hymns. Glory to the newborn kings. They were twins. I didn't know Mary had twins. It says she took her baby and put him in a manger. It didn't say she took her babies. Well, the Gnostics believed that Thomas was the twin brother of Jesus because Thomas had a Greek name and his name was Didymus and the Greek word Didymus means twin. His Hebrew name was Thomas. So the Gnostics said Thomas was the twin brother of Jesus. So the twin brother of Jesus comes to Jerusalem on Passover weekend, hears about the news, goes to the tomb, takes his body, hides it, and then appears to the disciples and says, hey, I'm back, guys. And they're like, you got no marks on you. It's silly. Somebody did a PhD on this, University of California, and it passed. Oy vey, them the pepper dies. Number seven, the pagan dependence theory. 
Christianity borrowed from the Greeks and the Romans. They're pagan, the, the, the pagan dying and rising gods. Major problem with that. The story of the dying and rising gods came after Christianity, not before Christianity. If any borrowing took place, it was the other way around. Besides, the dying and rising gods of Greek and Roman mythology was based on the crop cycle. In the autumn, things die. Leaves fall, and everything goes dormant. The gods descend into the netherworld. And he's trapped there in the netherworld, and it gets dark, and the light diminishes, and the darkness pervades. And then in the spring, that god comes up again, and we see that with the blooming of the flowers, the blooming of the trees. That, folks, is not Christianity. Christianity is not based on the crop cycle. It's based on a real human person. I don't know any historian that thinks Hercules existed. I don't know any historian who thinks Perseus existed, or Prometheus existed. Rather, Perseus had a, a, a horse with wings called Pegasus. But Jesus certainly existed. And C.S. Lewis said that the myths, because he was known, he was a, he's a great scholar in the area of myths and, 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 and folklore. He, he gave us the witch and you know, the, the wardrobe, the witch and the lion and so forth, and the Chronicles of Narnia. He said, I know what myth looks like. The Gospels do not read that way. And so, folks, all of this to say, we have enough evidence to take us to the moon and back. Jesus Christ is risen. He lives. He's the only savior of humanity, the only hope that this world has. And so when we think of our loved ones who've passed, fathers, mothers, husbands, wives, sons, daughters, this day reminds us that death shall not have the last say. Oh, death, as John Donne said, be not proud. O oh, death, thou shalt die. And it did die. The death of Christ is the guarantee of the death of death. And that's why John Owen wrote, the death of death in the death of Christ. And one day, one day, we will see our loved ones. We will be resurrected to have a body like his. And he will make all things new. A new heaven and a new earth is coming. We're in dwells righteousness. That is the hope of the gospel. That Christ is raising up a new people, a new redeemed people with a new federal head, alive in him. And one day, he will come to transform our lowly bodies that they may be conformed to his glorious body. And as the early church said, Maranatha, even so, come Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Amen.